So secondary storage, as far as databases are concerned, is going to be, we're going to have a database, and the amount of data in it is so large, the data can't fit in main memory. So it's all written out on disk drives. And then we want to take into account how much time it takes to do certain database operations. So first, you know, we'll just talk kind of briefly about what is primary storage. So primary storage is storage that typically runs on electricity or that a processor can read and write from very, very quickly. So it's like main memory, cache memory, maybe even flash memory that you can read and write to very quickly. You don't have to take lots of data and move it into memory, make changes to it, and then copy the result back out to memory. Um, secondary storage is basically storage that takes, the reason we break the two into primary and secondary, secondary storage is storage that typically takes a long time to get a copy of it into memory. And then what you're doing with it happens very, very quickly. So we could have magnetic disks, optical disks like CDs and DVDs, and, and uh, magnetic tape, although the tape, tape's kind of starting to become outdated. So if we go out to a tape to bring in data, that will take a while for the tape to, to load um, its data. Okay, so we can have files, and, th and if you take an operating system course, these topics come up in those courses too. We can have files. When you save a file out on a disk drive, so this is really leaving databases and just talking about operating systems. When you save a file out on a disk drive, let's say you have a Word document, a Microsoft Word document, and you're writing a book or something like that, and you hit save. Um, would you expect the place on the disk drive to have an open, would you expect the operating system to find an opening big enough to put your entire file in? Or could they take the file and cut it up into little pieces and scatter it all over the place and then somehow connect them together. So, well, I don't know, have you guys taken an op operating system class? No. no. Okay, so you have. So, um, so there's different techniques of recording a file on the disk. One technique is a, a sequential file. So the files have some type of order to them. And what we can do is we have, this could be like a database, and the database has records in it, and then each record, maybe at the end of it, has a pointer to the next record. So the, the data is somehow in order, reported in order. And uh, so that would end up being called a sequential file. Another way that we could um, record data would be if we had an index on the file. So that's very similar to if you have a book and the book has an index, like chapter one is on this page, chapter two is on this page. So you're actually taking up a piece of storage and you're saying this is where stuff is if you want to find it quickly. So for example, we can have our file written as an index. So our index is, uh, so we could have like Eaton Town and then Long Branch and Red Bank, so these are towns in New Jersey. And then our records are in a row and we have a pointer that says the Eaton Town one start here the long branch one start here, and the red bank one start here. So what would be the advantage of having this index? Well, suppose you wanted to go through your data and you only care about the ones that are where the city is long branch. So instead of going through all of them and saying go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, oh, I finally found the first one, we can go directly there and then just go next one, next one, next one until the city changes. And this would help if the uh, data was in order. So the index can help you find stuff quicker. Just like the you know, chapter one, chapter two at the beginning of a book helps you find what page that if you want to go straight to chapter eight, you look at the, the index. It tells you where to go. So an index file out on a disk drive might look something like this. So let's say we had a file. We had a file, and we take the disk drive and we cut it up into equal size blocks. And we want to have a file, so part of the file now, if we have an index file, part of the file is going to be the index. So we would record in our directory that our file, and maybe it has a name like G, and uh, so we got this picture somewhere off the internet. So if somebody was like had a file about maybe they bought a Jeep. And it would be block number 19. So block number 19 tells you where the index to the file is. So you go out to the disk drive into block number 19, and here's block number 19. You bring this data into memory, and it says the file in order, 
is block 9, followed by block 16, block then 1, then 10, then 25, and so on. So, if you want to know when the actual file starts, maybe writing a, a Microsoft Word document, the actual Word document data would begin in block number 9. So you go to block number 9, here's the first part of your file. And then block 16, after this is done, here's the second part, block 16. Block 1 has the third part. Block 10 has the fourth part. Block 25 has the fifth part. And then what do you think these minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 represent? Or why, they're, why they would be needed? So what we're doing is we have a file and we've decided for convenience reasons, we've decided to have an index on it. And the whole art of database file management is to use a lot of indexes. So we want to get across the idea of an index. So if, we, if this is our actual data and we decide we want to, for speed reasons, we want to add an index. So we're going to say, okay, all the in-time records start here, the long branch records start here, Red Bank records start here. And the reason we want to do that is we're going to do queries like give me all the accounts from a bank that is in Long Branch that have a balance greater than this. And we don't want to read through all the records, we just want to read through the Long Branch ones. So we'd like to get there quickly. So when we decide to make the file an index file, that means we have data plus this new thing, the index, pointing to it. A couple of advantages and a couple of disadvantages to having an index. So what are the Let's start with the advantages. What's the advantage of having an index? The advantage is we can find specific stuff quicker rather than going through. The disadvantage is, number one, you're taking up space creating the index. Same thing's true in a book. If you have a 100-page book and then you put an index at the beginning, a three, four-page index telling you where stuff is in the book, now it's a 104-page book. So you added more pages. So same thing, we're taking up extra space and then the other thing is anytime we want to find anything, the first thing we have to do is go to the index to find where we are. Um, so yeah, so that'll end up taking up more space. The other thing is when we, if we were to add a new record um, of a branch that's brand new, what would we have to do? We'd have to update the index with a new field here and then have a new point. Okay, so if we wanted to bring an indexed file into memory, and the disk drive, the size of the blocks on the disk drive, they're not decided by the database system. It's decided, that's decided by the operating system that the database is running on. So for example, you could buy a Windows, like some of you I know have a laptop running Windows. You could then download MySQL database, but it will have to deal with the way Windows gets and retrieves data off of the disk. So it's the database interacting with the operating system. <clears throat> so if you want to create a, a, uh, an indexed file, and you decide, OK, the first block I go to is going to be the block that has my index in it. <clears throat> then when I go to get the index, here's the index. It tells me where all the parts of the file are. I guess one interesting operating systems question is, after you have, if the index says that there's blocks one, two, three, four, five, the file is contained in five blocks. But the amount of space in this block, it can contain the address of, of the five blocks, but it has some extra space. Should you now start the file in this block, or should you start the file on a fresh block? Is there a, what's the plus or minus to doing that? It completely depends on the algorithm which you use because uh, I mean when you use uh, fill up the gaps right I mean when you use the uh, algorithm like uh, uh, no spaces will be available uh, I mean um, no space left okay. then you can fill these minus threes I mean there is minus one minus one minus one there are right. plenty of spaces in that 19th block so you fill the uh, addresses over there right uh, when you are use an algorithm, don't mess with uh, two. I mean, 19 is uh, address of FDU and uh, 20 is address of uh, Madison, something else. Right. So don't mess right. two addresses okay. together. Use separate one. 
Whatever the space is wasting, I don't care. You don't care that it wasted the space. So basically what we're doing is we're saying we're going to dedicate a block to the index. If the size of the index is smaller than a block, we'll, we'll, we're not going to start the file here. So that would mean that really the first block would be 19 because the file would actually be starting here. So we're going to say, let's dedicate the whole block to being just an index. And if it doesn't fit, I'm sorry, if the, uh, if the file has so few blocks that, let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight spaces for addresses and we only need five of them, we'll let the last three be a waste because having the file set uh, on different, uh, starting on different blocks could do that. It makes it easier if we want to copy the file somewhere. So you're not actually saying, oh, we have to strip away the index and copy, you know, if there was some data here, you'd have to actually copy this block, but the new copy would have different indices because it would be recorded in a different place. So it makes copying files easier and it also makes manipulating files easier. And whatever we read on the index, we don't, wouldn't have to load this page back in. So unfortunately, we're now, when, we've decide, when we decide we want to put an index on a data set, which we're going to be doing a lot in, in databases, we just want to be mindful of the fact that, yeah, you're going to take up a block just for the index. And if the index gets so big that it can't fit in one block, then we're going to have blocks of indexes. You might have 10 blocks just for the index. In fact, we might even have a, a block that has pointers to all the blocks of the index. So it might be like a two-level. Um, index. But that's fine. It's going to have a tremendous amount of savings for us. Okay, so we'll talk about in more detail in another class B plus trees, but I just want to go over um, how in database systems uh, a, a B plus tree comes into play. So the idea, so first of all, I mean you can read this stuff later, I'm not going to read the slide to you, but the idea is a, a tree in a data structures and algorithms class, you visit a node and it has data about something and you can decide to go left or go right if you're searching for something and eventually you find the node you're looking for. And when you're there, every piece of data you would want is there. What a B plus tree is, so the B stands for balance. So we're not going to have a tree that has long branches and short branches. They're all going to have the same size branches. So it's going to be a balance tree. But the other thing is, as we're searching through each of the levels, we don't have all the data about the record. We only have data about the field we're searching on. So let's say there's a person who has a, a first name and a last name and a, a job and a date of birth and a social security number, blah, blah, blah. And we make an index based on their last name. So let's say we're going to do queries and we only want people whose last name is between J and L. So we have an index that tells where the J's start and then we just go, you know, we look for the next one and the next one and the next one until we are out of the L's and then we're done. So when we create the index, at each node along the tree, we don't have all the data about the person, all we have is data about their last name. And it'll tell us whether we go left or right. So if there's a binary tree, it'll tell us whether we go left or to the right. What we're going to do, because we're worried more in databases, we're worried more about going out to the disk drive and bringing in a big chunk of data, we're going to try to get as much data into each block as possible. <clears throat> so, instead of having, like in a binary tree, you have one value and you either go left or right. If the field you're looking for is less than it, you go left. If it's greater than it, you go right. Now what we're going to do when you visit a node, we're going to have many, many values. And if the value you're looking for, we go searching through them. If the value is less than one field or greater than another, there'll be a pointer between the two, and that's the branch you would take. So we can have, um, we're going to have a certain number of pointers and a certain number of values. And for every value, there's a pointer between them. And you would take that pointer if the value you're looking for is between those two. Okay. So, and the idea is, we, every time, so this is really where our data structure, the search tree, which we're going to use a B plus tree for, the tree is so big that the data could never fit into memory, and we want to go out to the disk drive as few times as possible. So we want to go out to the disk drive and get a big leaf on the tree, bring it into memory, analyze it, and that'll tell us to go out to the disk drive, which is the next block to bring. So we're trying to have 
a tree that has as few levels to it as possible because each level is a disk. We have to go out to the disk drive and bring something, uh, bring something in. So the notation for B plus trees, like I said, they're balanced trees. So we don't want long branches and short branches. So we're going to have a rule that says every node can have a minimum of so many leaves and a maximum of so many leaves. So we typically refer to it as an X dash Y B B plus tree. So this is uh, so where X is the minimum number of of children it can have and Y is the maximum. So for example, you could have a two three tree, and that says that every node there are uh, a minimum of two children and a maximum of three children. Like I said, we'll go into more details about B plus trees in, a, in another class. Um, so the B stands for balance, and tree means that there's no cycles in it. And then the X and the Y is the minimum number and maximum number of children at each node. So we could have a, a database, it might make sense for us to have a 50, 100 B plus tree. That means that each node in the tree could have up to 50 children. So we, could record, we would record 49 values, and then you would look at where you compare to those 49 values, and you could look at the 50 pointers, whichever pointer makes sense for you to take. OK. Yeah, so all right. So <laughs> you could read this when you get a chance. But, that, the, but the idea is the analysis of the B plus tree in the end we want to go searching through a large amount of data. So we bring the root of the tree into memory, look, for the, look through that root for, for which child to pick um, to know the next disk I.O. to bring in, bring that disk in, look through that one, and work our way down to the bottom of the tree as quickly as possible. So like I say, you can, you can read through this when you get a chance. Okay. So let's say we had an example um, just to get an idea of the idea, we want to make the tree as short as possible. Um, suppose we had uh, a page size of four kilobytes. And a field that we're searching on, maybe somebody's last name, we decide to use 32 bits, maybe the last name, uh, sorry, 32 bytes. So uh, that could be like 16, using 16 bits per character, that could be 16 letters. Let's say a name can have 16 letters. And then the address of where we would go to once we decide, OK, I'm less than this value and I'm greater than this value, so now I want to go to the next level of the tree and bring in a chunk of data. Maybe the addresses are 8 bytes long. And suppose your database has 1 million records such as this. If you've decided to use a, a, a tree, a 50-100 tree, meaning each, each uh, hop on the tree can have, each node on the tree could have, it has to have a minimum of 50 children and a maximum of 100 children. Then we could, we would choose that size because if we were to take 32 bytes plus four, th 32 bytes plus 8 bytes, which would be 40 bytes, we could fit up to 100 of those into a disk and into a four kilobyte um, operation. So the question that's being answered here was, if we had a million records in our database, and we go out to the disk drive and bring in chunks of data in 4K hops at a time, we want to take that 4K block and put as much data of our index into each block. How much data could fit in each block? Well, in the best case, we'd have 100, a uh, worst case, we'd have 100 divided by 2, 50 children. So if we took the log, this should actually be a little 50. This should be log base 50 of a million. It would take four hops to get to the bottom of the tree. So is that, uh, that <laughs> if you took an algorithm class, that would be like a common computation to do. But if you have a tree, it's kind of like a binary tree. You had a binary tree, like uh, let's say you had 16 values. You had a tree and then it had two children, they had two children, they had two children. So you have 16 nodes. The idea is if you started at the top of the tree and hop down each level till you got to the bottom, because you're searching for something, so you look at the first node and say, oh, the thing I'm looking for is to the left. Then you look at the next one, oh, it's to the right, oh, to the left. 
The question is, how many hops would it take for you to get down the tree? If it was a binary tree, if every node had two children, it would be log base 2 of the size of the tree. So log base 2 of, let's say, 16 would be 4 hops. Log, if it was 32 nodes, that would just add one more level to the tree, it would be, I'm sorry, if log base, if it's 16 nodes, it would be 4 hops. Log base 2 of 16 is 4. So this is a case where we want to have as many children as we can so the tree will be shorter, but of course it will be much fatter. But we don't care how fat it is because we're, in the database world, we're talking about going out to the disk drive as few times as possible. So every time we go out to the disk drive, we want to bring in a big node of our tree. So we want the nodes to be as big as possible. So if our worst case scenario was that each, uh, like, like we said, this is going to be a 5100 um, balance tree, Worst case scenario is each node could have 50 children. So the question is, um, if we were to search a million records, how many hops starting at the top of the tree would we have to go until we hit the bottom of the tree? So the worst case scenario would be log base 50 of a million, which would be four hops. If it was log base 100, it would probably be less than two hops. So, so the worst case scenario, even when we have a very large number of records, like a million, and we have a block size of 4K, it would be the worst case scenario to take four hops to get from the top of the tree down to the thing we're looking for. Now, just because we went through the index doesn't mean we've gotten all the data we want. Now we have to go out to the disk drive and bring in the data, but we will now have the pointer to where it starts. And considering the fact that in most databases, the root node of the tree is always kept in main memory because every search starts there. It would actually, we'd only have to go out to the disk drive three times in this case even though we have a million records. Okay. So, so, the, so really what we're talking about here, what makes this topic different than if you took an analysis of algorithms class, in a, in a course like analysis of algorithms, you're asked to solve a question based on a large number of inputs, and you write an algorithm that will find you the answer as quickly as possible and it's the number of times you read and write from your data you have to count up and do have that be as minimal as possible. In the database world, going out to the disk drive is far more time consuming than any computation you're doing on main memory. And since we're dealing with really, really large data sets, we want to go out to the disk drive as, few, as, as least often as possible. So we're really counting how many times we go out to the disk drive. Once we get the data in, if you have an algorithm that really takes a long time, we're, not, we're actually ignoring that in this case. So hopefully what you're doing once the data comes in is something that's not too time consuming. But here in the database world, we're focusing on how many times we go out to the disk drive. So suppose there is an SQL statement, and the statement says, bring in all the fields from these two tables, R and S, where one of the fields in R matches one of the fields in S. Okay, so how would that computation be done? Pretend all the data from both tables is in main memory. What would you have to do to find all the records where the attribute A from table R matches the attribute B from table S? So we have every record of R in memory and every record of S in memory, and now what do we have to do? We need to match them. Right, we'd have to kind of put a pointer at the beginning of each one, have one pointer stay still and have the other one go through all of them and say, find a match. Then make this pointer go up by one, go back to the beginning, and look for another match, right? Is there any quicker way in doing that? Okay, so really, that's, it's, that's why database searching is very in, intensive. So now, if... Um, if this had 100 records and this had 1,000 records, how many comparisons are we going to do? 100,000. 100,000. Each one times the other one. 100,000 uh, comparisons. So what we're doing when we're calculating how much time this takes, we're going to mostly focus on how many times we go out to the disk drive. So what if these two data, th these two tables in their entirety cannot fit in main memory? Uh, then what are we going to do? Okay, so first of all, yeah, like we said, the algorithm is going to be for every record in R, 
we're going to say for every record in S, if these two match, add them to the answer, otherwise ignore them. So, right, it would take, you know, um, yeah, so I'm following, doing this example. Table R has a hundred rows or tuples, table S has a thousand, so we're going to take a hundred thousand comparisons, if they were all in memory. Suppose they're not in memory, and the operating system has other stuff going on at the time, uh, you know, so it needs storage for other things, but the operating system says, well, I'm going to give your database um, 11 pages of storage for you to use. But let's say these tables don't fit in 11 pages. The post them much bigger than that. But the operating system says you can only have 11 because they need the pages for other processes that are run. Now suppose, and again, these are just throwing these numbers around to get an example. Suppose six records of table R can fit in one page frame. And suppose maybe table S, the records are a little bit smaller. The you know, all the data in the column is a little bit smaller. You could fit 10 in to a page frame. Okay. So first of all, if you wanted to copy... Right, so, so here's the thing we're going to do. We have this computation that's going to take 100, 100 times 1,000, 100,000 comparisons. But we don't have enough space to copy both databases in memory and do the 100,000 comparisons. So we're very limited. So we're, we're going to take data from one table, data from another one, do the comparisons, then go out, bring in new data, finish up where, you know, and keep doing that <laughs> until we've done all the comparisons. So if we have, if a page frame on this operating system, maybe they give you 4K, whatever, however big they are, can only handle, can only hold six records from relationship R. If we wanted to bring the whole database in, how many pages would we have to bring in? So the, the database has a hundred records in it, and we can fit six into a frame. So if we went out to the, to the uh, disk drive and said, bring the whole database in, how many frames would we have to bring in? Not counting indexes. So if we just wanted to bring it, how many frames would it be? It would end up being uh, 100 divided by 6, which might not be a 16 point something, right? So it would be 17 to bring the whole thing in. So 16, and then the last one would be like half filled. So it would take 17. If we wanted to bring in the whole, um, the second table, which has 1,000 records, and only 10 could fit in, it would be 1,000 times. 1,000 divided by 10 rounded up, but that would be 100, 100 records, right? So, if the, if the operating system gave us 117 buffers, then what we would do is we'd go and bring the whole table R in, bring the whole table S in, and then do the comparison, right? What if they only gave us 11? That's a very small amount. This is going to be a real headache for us, right? So what, what are some options that we could do? Of the 11 buffers, so wait, does it first make sense if they gave us, we said it would take 17 frames to bring in relationship R and 100 frames to bring in relationship S. So if the operating system gave us 117 frames and said, you know, go do whatever you want, we would just bring in the complete tables and then do our comparison. Right? We wouldn't have to go out to the disk drive again. So if they came along and said, oh, you only get 10, uh, we only get 11 buffers, would that make us have to go out to the disk drive much more often? So what are some options we could do as far as executing this select statement? Well, without a doubt, we have to have at least one buffer have R records in it and one have S records because the whole computation is a comparison. So we'd have to have at least you know, one buffer for the R's and maybe 10 buffers for the S's, or... Repeated. What's that? Repeated uh, erasing the S. Right, so, so one option, so there's a couple of extreme, the extreme options would be to have one buffer for R and 10 buffers for S. So we would bring in 
the first record of R and the first ten records of, the, I'm sorry, the first frame of R, which would be six records, and then the next, the first ten pages of S, which would be 10 times 10, that would be 100 records. Do those comparisons. And then what would be our next move? Delete the S and take the next 10 pages the of S. The next 10 of S, do a comparison. Bring in the next 10 of S, do a comparison. Then once we finally get through S, what do we have to do? Delete the R one. Bring in the, the second box of R, <laughs> then bring all the S's in again. Right, so, that, so you can see. If the operating system is being very stingy, only giving us 11 bu buffers, and the reason I'm telling you now, the reason I picked 11 is um, of all the things we could do, we could give one buffer to one and all the remaining to the other. We could have given five to this one and six to this one, but would that, that wouldn't be as good, right? Because you'd be, the number of times you'd bring in one complete data set would be doubling if you did something like that. So it ends up being the best answer to do is to pick one of these, and we'll want to pick the best one. Give one buffer to that and all the other buffers to the other one. So I, the reason I picked 11 is because I know it's going to be broken into a 1 and a 10 <laughs> combination. So it makes the math easy by making 11 buffers. But the operating system giving us far less than what we would like, what we would like would be 117. 117, we can bring in everything. They only give us 11. Let's say we were to, let's consider both extreme cases. Suppose we were to give 10 buffers to R and one buffer to S. So if we were to say the number of records in R and the, divided by the number of records that can fit in a frame and round that up, we said that this was 17, right? Someone said 16 point something, so it's 17 IOs plus now, how many times do we have to bring in the whole data set of S? Well, we'd have, to, we'd have to bring in the whole data set of S. But every time we said we brought in a section of S, then we had to bring in the next part of R, bring in the, all of S again. So the number of times we're going to have to bring in S is the number of records that can, the, the database R, the number of records that can fit into database R per block. Right, so BR is the number of buffers we would be given to R. So in this case, we would have to bring in R. We bring in R one time, and we bring in S. We'd have to bring in S two times. I'm sorry. We would have to bring in S. What? So right. The the number of times that we would have to bring in S. So bringing in S would take. 1,000 records, 10 per record, it would take in 100 IOs, but the number of times we'd have to do it would be um, this number, 17, divided by the number of buffers that we give to R, which we decided to give 10 to R. So we actually, we can, we can bring in 10, and then bring it, so <laughs> we're bringing in 10, of the 17 buffers for R, then using the one remaining buffer for S and bringing in the whole S relationship. And then we'd have to bring in S a second time when we filled up the 10 buffers with the next batch of R, which would be the seven remaining buffers of R. Then we'd have to bring in S again on top of that one empty frame that was dedicated to S. So in that case, we went from, if, if the operating system gave us unlimited buffers, we could do the whole thing with 117 IOs after the disk drive. If we decided to give relationship R 10 buffers and S1 buffer, it's going to take us 217. So we're going to bring in, we're going to do 17 disk IOs to bring in the whole database of R. And then there's two sets of them that we have to bring in S. So we have to bring in S two times. So it would be 17 for R, and then S takes 100 disk IOs, and we have to bring in S two times. So it would be 217 disk IOs. In addition to that, we have to compare all the fields. But that would be done in main memory. So suppose we decided, um, oh, now, okay, now suppose, same computation, 
but you decided to make um, you decided to make which uh, we decided to make the file have a two level index. So we decided to have put add an index onto our uh, let's see. Now suppose that B has a two level index. The field B in the key key value. Uh, okay. So we're gonna have an index and the number of records that can fit into an index is 100. So that is there's 100 index can fit into a buffer. So what this is going to do is the same computation as before. We're going to have 17 IOs to bring in R. Then we're going to bring in, we have to bring in S. But suppose we have to go out bring in an index, which brings us to a child index, which then eventually gets us to the records that we want. So it would be the same computation as before. 17 IOs to bring in R. 100 IOs times, 100 IOs is the amount of data that we had to bring in. Two is the number of times you have to bring S in, and three is the number of hops down the index to get to the final record that we're looking for. So that would cost us 617 disk IOs if uh, the S data set had a two level index on it. So adding indexes, so, so the idea is we're going to be adding indexes in this course, but we want to be mindful of the fact sometimes it could make um, input outputs take longer. And then suppose, uh, so, so instead of trying to get an improvement over that 617, would be if we had nine buffers go to R, one buffer go to the index, and one buffer go to the data that S is in. Then we would have 17 IOs for relationship R, plus one IO for the index. And then we do 1 plus 1 times our original value of 2 for every field in uh, S. So here's an example where using an index combined with distributing our buffers, one, so, so instead of using 10 for R, we use 9 for R, give an extra buffer to S, one to hold the index and one to hold the data that the index is pointing at. And then we could, would have the whole thing done in 23 um, this guy goes. So the rule of thumb is to look at the inner loop of relationship and give enough buffers to handle the index and the pages in it and then give the remaining to the outer loop. That ends up being the rule of thumb to have the least number of disk IOs. So yeah, so again, what, what we're basically talking about here is when we do a statement, these statements can be very expensive. A select from two tables where some fields match. So the idea is um, if the records are all random, then unfortunately we would have to bring in every record from this table and every record from this table and do, you know, blindly compare them all. If we're given a limited number of buffers to work with, we have to decide what's the best way to give buffers to one table and the other table. If we had an index on one of the files, then maybe we don't have to go through every record. We could just go to the, to the buffers where those, that data is. But now the index is a problem because the index, we decided we're going to dedicate a whole block just to the index. So if we did that and we went out, got the index, and that told us where the block was, then the next time we went through, got the index, told us where the block was, that would actually increase the number of uh, IOs. So then we decided the best way to handle indexes is give one block for the index, one block for the data is pulling in, and then that could give us a big savings on the number of IOs. Okay.